You know, like a singer doesn't care about your microphone or what kind of silver plated cables you have or that you've got special power cables or they don't care about any of this stuff. They care that they would like to have a cup of tea or they need a pencil or the pencil they have is not sharpened and they can't write their lyrics or sketch out their idea or they have nowhere to write it or the bathroom's a disaster. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Hello, rock stars. It's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I created this show to introduce you to real world recording professionals, to hear their stories and learn from their experiences so that you can take your records to the next level and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Steve Walsh, an award-winning songwriter, engineer, and executive producer of Bang Europe. Steve has been writing and recording for over three decades and has scored music for countless commercials, film, and TV, receiving awards from Lions, Cleos, AICP, DNAD, and even a Czech Andel Award. A Berklee College of Music graduate, Steve was born in Boston, but has lived and recorded in New York City, Nashville, Tennessee, and now Prague, Czechoslovakia, with his family, where Steve says, in his own words, he's reminded daily that speaking Czech is infinitely more difficult than making a living as a musician. He continues to play guitar, record, and tour with his own band, and his latest album, Daily Specials, was released on the acclaimed Czech label, Animal Music. When back in New York City, he regularly performs with the Brooklyn Boogaloo Blowout, along with Grammy-nominated bassist and composer Victor Krauss. Steve's song and production credits include creating the number one song in Denmark, a top 10 in the UK, and a top 20 in the US. And more recently, his song Stars in My Eyes was released on legendary singer Judy Collins' 2015 all-star duet release, Strangers Again. Production, writing, and engineering credits include Erasure, One Republic, Phil Eisler, O'Shea, Anna Kay featuring Reef, and Spotify's South by Southwest concert series. Please welcome Steve Walsh to Recording Studio Rockstars. Steve, are you ready to rock, my friend? Born ready, baby. Nice, man. Tell me, how would I say, are you ready to rock in Czechoslovakian? Mužeš rokovat. (laughs) <laughs> nice, man. I love that. Mujesh <laughs> Rakovat. It's great to be talking with you again. We're, we're old friends, but I haven't spoken to you in years. And it's just so cool that I'm connecting with you all the way across the world like this. Can you introduce yourself a little in your own words too, even though much of that was your own words as well? And just kind of tell us more about who you are and how you got to get started in music and end up in Prague of all places. Yeah, well, I guess the getting to Prague part is not so typical, but everything else is. Kind of a 12 years old, started playing guitar, fell in love with heavy metal and the Beatles, and slowly just got more and more into music and started to try to unlock how it all works. It led me on to study at Berkeley, and then in the late mid to late 90s, a bunch of our friends of mine and myself, we all moved to New York to take over the world and ended up finding my way to Nashville. And, you know, I think for me, it's been really interesting because I'm a musician, guitar player, turned producer in terms of helping people I was making music with get their music recorded. I started to get into composing led me into getting into mixing. So for me, I've kind of done a lot of different things. The main thing is I just love helping people make music. Yeah, man. Very cool. I've listened to your work online, this more recent stuff, and it's very cool stuff. And I I think that there's something that seems like it'd be a lot of fun with the composing side of things, especially when you're composing for film and TV. It's strike. I I don't do as much of it, so it, but it seems like it's just seems fun. It is. I mean, the process is super fun. And I think that the big thing for me is when I first got into it, you know, outside of having like a four track cassette, you know, recorder, like a Porta studio, I never really owned a computer before 1997. And right around the time that GG001 came out is when I started to get into it all. And I felt like I got a job through a friend of mine composing and helping him at a music company in New York. And you've heard a lot of engineers say this, but learning how to work in the commercial and television music world 
really get your Pro Tools and Studio Chops together so fast because the workflow, the workflow is very different than the recording studio in the sense that it, everything just moves so quickly. Sometimes you're working on stuff you're super in, passionately involved in, and sometimes maybe you're less passionately involved in. But sometimes that's the ideal place to get your skills together because you can really focus on learning the tools. Yeah, I mean, at the speed of production for TV and film is sort of like, can you please deliver us this idea that we haven't had yet yesterday? Exactly, exactly. And I kind of got into it more from kind of playing sessions in New York and slowly moved more into that space. And being loving so much different kinds of music, that part seemed pretty natural to me in terms of, you know, just making stuff up in different styles. And it really just pushed me into really trying to take what's in your head and see if you can get it out of your head and record it. So you started out on guitar, and guitar is your your main instrument. Even your Skype image here is you playing a guitar. But I imagine when you're getting into composition and you're in the computer, you must have had to adapt to keyboards more, or have you tried to keep it really guitar-focused? You know, that's a good question. There's been so many times that I've studied piano over the last however many years and kind of made a push to get more into composing from that frame of mind, and it doesn't work for me. I think it's always important to just play to your strengths. So for me, it's dealing with stringed instruments. I think I'm good at dealing with like arranging rhythm sections and things like that. But I also know, and I think this is the biggest lesson I learned in Nashville, music's made best by committee and always get someone who's going to do that particular part better than you and collaborate with those people. So I try to always know my strengths, know my weaknesses, and I collaborate with a lot of keyboard player arrangers who primarily play keyboards and good orchestrators. It works so much better for me. The other way is just doesn't work. It's just wasting energy that I could be spending making better guitar-based music. Well, so that's a fascinating quote that you just said, that music is always made better by committee, because it sounds like the opposite of what you might expect somebody to say about something done by committee. You know, for example, mixing by committee, you might frown on that a little bit or, or something like that. You know, you talk about too many cooks in the kitchen at times, but you're absolutely right. I, I do find that music is great when it's made with groups of people, you know, if you find a way to do that. Can you elaborate more on what you mean by making music with a committee? And well, you know, I feel like when I was living in New York City, it was so often that we'd have teams of rhythm sections, much like the way we would have, as you know so well, in Nashville, except because of, I guess, rent and the physical size and maybe musical trends, it was less common to be playing together in the studio in New York than it is in Nashville even to this day. So, so often you'd be in a rehearsal working with a singer-songwriter or an artist and making contributions to their music, but then you get to the recording studio and it would kind of be an overdub situation where they're slowly layering everybody on top of each other. Right, it's you versus the computer. Exactly. And they would say, well, I want it to feel organic. I want it to feel like there's interaction, but nobody's interacting. And I remember the first time I came down to Nashville and saw some sessions and saw how things work, it was like, ah, I mean, the truth is still to this day in Nashville, there are more groups of human beings playing the song, same song at the same time than anywhere else on the planet Earth. And that you can waste so much time when you're doing everything by yourself or you're micromanaging other people than if you just get everybody together and start playing. Wait, you're saying that you can't take a solo through email? You can, and it's and you spend so much time trying to make it feel like you did it with the band. It's insane. <laughs> <laughs> what are some other places? What do you think about, you know, mixing by committee, producing by committee, that that sort of thing? Do you think that that is a place where you need to have a singular focus, or do you think that that also works? I think with mixing, mixing is a little different. Once you get to the mixing stage, I feel if you're together in the room and there's a common vision for what you're trying to do and people are relatively self-aware of what the actual goal is, maybe there's better odds of it being a good experience. But I always feel, and I've made this mistake early on, I think we all have, is overcommitting when you're working on a record. Like for instance, someone wants to work with some hero of theirs or so-and-so is going to mix a record and it's going to be great. And you're like, great. 
and then they start and maybe it isn't the right fit for whatever reason, or you've overcommitted and there's no way back where I think a better way, especially with people's recording projects and especially when they're on a budget is mix a song, kind of get some sort of galvanized, you know, united front on what you're trying to do and then trust the mixer to realize what it is you're trying to do, talk about it a lot in the beginning, get on the same page. Otherwise, it can so quickly get into a bad place. And then it's just so heartbreaking, you know, for the artists that their music isn't coming out the way they want. And it actually is probably not even the mixer's fault. Yeah. I imagine that for those who are maybe just in a band and one of the band members is mixing, it's the same same process. You know, have that dialogue, have a discussion about it. The real trick that we're all faced with is how do you make something sound like a record when people say that, especially younger younger artists or younger bands? And the truth is you have to really, and this starts at the beginning of the production process, is you really need to kind of figure out what the project is, what the scope of the project's going to be, and how to best get there in order to make it sound and have the experience feel the way you want it to feel. Because the truth is, mixing starts at the very first meeting between a producer and an artist. And it's slowly, it's like taking a wide-angle lens photograph and slowly focusing the whole process. And especially for people who are making their first record, is trying to make it feel just on the edge of being a little out of reach, but not pushing too far, where someone starts to become stressed, where they're inspired to get to the next level. And if you get to the, you know, the mixing part and you haven't gotten those pieces in place, it's so difficult to get for the mixer to get to a place where people are going to be happy because they've left all the decisions to the end, which also happens in film and TV. It's really a hard place. Yeah. Well, uh, just another thought about the music by committee. I think when you say that, what's good about it is you're talking about a committee where each member of the committee is playing an individual instrument and that's where music comes together. But if you have a committee trying to, you know, commit the one member playing one instrument, then it sort of falls apart again. When you got five people telling the guitar player how to play their solo, it kind of sucks. I think from my experience, because going to music school and being with a group of guys that are all either, you know, primarily kind of professional sidemen, or even if they're in bands, they're still coming kind of from that frame of mind. It's like a surgical team that has such a collective experience and relatable experiences and a common body of understanding which direction is up and which direction is down and left and right, that it's a team. It's like a sports team or whatever. It's, you know, you trust these people because they share your values, but they're experts at their particular thing. And I think the older I get, the more Because I have my hand in a lot of different things, I come to rely on these people more and more every day. And I trust that, you know, we have some sort of common reference point that I can allow them to be the artists they are and contribute to the project. So if you look at a lot of the work I've done has been more with solo artists and more working with sidemen in that regard. So it's been interesting to get stronger at working with bands. Yeah. Well, that's cool stuff, man. I like I like talking about all that. Well, yeah. so, so Steve, I like to ask our guests to kind of launch us off on the podcast with an inspirational quote about, you know, getting, getting us excited to make records. You got anything you'd like to share with us? There's a great saxophone player, band leader named Lenny Pickett, who is in Tower of Power and co-leads the Saturday Night Live band. And he's, there's a thing he's called Lenny Pickett's Rules. And Lenny Pickett says, always say yes, be on time, don't complain, and it's nice to be important but it's more important to be nice. That's great, man. I like (laughs) it. It's funny because that last one is a very Nashville axiom too. Uh, I I hear that over and over again about people who are seeing a lot of success making records, playing in bands, doing sessions, mixing, mastering, any level songwriting. I'm always told that it's important to be a good people person, you know, just be able to connect with everybody and Be somebody that everybody wants to be around. Absolutely. I mean, life, let alone life in music, is already challenging enough. It's like, this is more than half of the game. What what do you guys know about challenges over there in Prague, Czechoslovakia? (laughs) I'm I'm kidding, of course. 
Yeah. Well, besides besides the communist past, the uh, sometimes the ground hum is you don't know where it's coming from. <laughs> yeah, really. Well, actually, let's talk about that for a minute. I mean, I I was telling you before we started this that in 1991, when I was backpacking around Europe, I went to Prague for a week and I loved it so much that I went back for another week. Of course, this is when $25, you could live like a king for a day. But how has Prague changed in the last, gosh, what is it, almost 30 years now? And what's it like to be living there and making records? Well, I would imagine for you, outside of the architecture, it would probably be relatively unrecognizable because like most places, the more time goes on, the more everywhere feels the same. You know, it's interesting making records here and there's an incredible group of musicians here and there's an incredible art scene. Prague is so famous for film film recording with orchestras. Many mm-hmm. people know that. There's lots of great studios for that. You know what, actually, can you back up? Let's assume for a minute people don't know much about that. Tell us a little bit about the orchestral stuff that's going on there. Well, before World War II, the Prague film industry was very big. And you hear it, sometimes you hear people refer to Prague as like a small Paris. And before the war, it very much was. There's so many famous painters, poets, critical thinkers, and musicians. Probably the most famous Czech composer is Dvořák. So many films, and there was a thriving film business in the 30s and 40s, which led to really, really great orchestras and recording music for film which was reinvigorated in the 90s. And because it was less expensive to record an orchestra than maybe in LA or London, a lot of projects started to come to the Czech Republic. So there's basically, which is actually, I should correct you, there's a big distinction now between, because when you were here, it was Czechoslovakia, and now the Czech Republic and Slovakia are divided. Of and course, people yeah. are, and, and people are very proud of this fact. So, But basically, there's three or four great studios here, and there's three or four great orchestras that can make up various size studio groups. And on a daily basis, there are all sorts of international film um, orchestral projects going on here, which is really great. And the players are fantastic. When I was there in 91, I remember we went to the symphony hall to go see the symphony play. And I'm I'm sure it cost a dollar or something like that. And it was, (laughs) I felt pretty cool about that at the time. Yeah. So there's this incredible music scene there. Even when I was there, there were rock bands, punk rock bands coming through and putting on shows and, you know, like an underground, vibrant rock and roll scene and and punk scene. And I was struck by the the creativity going on there. So is it still very vibrant like that now? It is in some ways, you know, it's become a little more homogenized, unfortunately, but there are lots, the things that are really interesting to me is the passion people have with their bands because the truth is to have a band, especially if you're singing in Czech or Slovak, there are some really large bands that make careers, but it's definitely not like, you know, if you were a European-based band and playing all over Europe. But the thing that's the most fascinating to me, and I think everyone will love this, is when I first came here, I've got a buddy who introduced me to his buddies. And these guys love everything British and American classic rock and roll and they revere it so much and it was so difficult for them to get access to this before the revolution that there are people here that are building the most incredible instruments or do the most incredible repair work and they know everything about vintage Fender instruments and amplifiers and vintage Gibson and this and that. So for instance, my vintage tube amps that I brought over here, you know, from the States are playing as well, if not better than when I had them in the States, because the guys that work on them revered them so much. And they've never even seen some of these, like I have a 1957 Fender Harvard, which was kind of the the amplifier Steve Cropper did so much of the stack stuff on. And a lot of these guys have never seen this thing, but they pull out their schematic that they got on the black market in the 80s and they know everything about it. And they're like, I can't believe I'm seeing one of these and I'm going to wind you a European 240 transformer for it. And and they're so hopped up about, you know, finding pallets of, not now, but back in the day, finding pallets of photocopiers to smash to take out the chips to build tube screamers because they've never seen a tube screamer, but they've heard it through some random Stevie Ray Vaughan recording or whatever. And now they're building them, you know, themselves. So 
This is super. When you start to see the challenges that we get down on in music sometimes, and then you meet these guys, it's like, this is a different ball game. That's cool. It's it's definitely fun to be around people who are excited about, you know, making music or building instruments and gear like that. Absolutely. It makes it more fun to, to work with it, you know? Like, for instance, my wife's dad, he's a metal worker, and he worked on the subway building the Prague Metro for many years. And he's a banjo player, and he developed concepts for tone rings and tension hoops, which are some of the key metal parts on banjos. He came and brought his designs. And now, you know, my father-in-law lives in a little village an hour and a half outside of Prague, and he's building parts for Gibson, Ohm, Stuart McDonald. He was building parts for Sterling banjos. And he's, you know, interacting with all of these super famous, you know, from Earl Scruggs when he was alive to Bela and all of these guys. So it's like, I made a record here a few months ago with Charlie McCoy and there's a big Nashville Prague connection. It's very interesting with some of these. Bluegrass is very, very popular here. Well, that's cool, man. I'll have to bring my banjo and my fiddle over there and scratch around. Maybe they'll think I'm okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's groovy, man. That's very cool. Can you share with us a story about an important failure for you? You know, you've been doing this for a long time. You've obviously navigated the globe in some pretty interesting ways. Tell us, you know, let's humanize it for a minute. Tell us where stuff didn't go as well for you, maybe turned out to be a great learning experience. Yeah, I always like to say experience is what you get when you don't get what you want. (laughs) Now, I feel like the thing I come back to is every time there's been a major disaster for me and really, really failed at something or something really didn't work out for me, it's because I wasn't self-aware enough. Or I didn't trust my gut. I feel like, you know, for me, it's like failures have really ranged from putting myself in positions where I had unrealistic expectations, or if I pushed too hard, or if I didn't stick to my guns, or if I knew I wasn't doing a good enough job, but somehow phoned it in or didn't, you know, push myself to do the job. And I think that's the biggest thing that I keep coming back to. And I think about really not trusting myself and really getting myself in situations where like I convinced myself that it could work when I knew deep down it couldn't work, whether yeah, whether it yeah. was because of me or because of the situation. And it's funny how those even keep coming up even today. Like you still, no matter how much you think you've learned that lesson, you've got to keep learning that lesson. It's a lesson that keeps on giving, unfortunately. Yeah, it's perspective, isn't it? It's those times where you lose your sense of perspective where had you just stepped up with a clear sense of perspective, you would have immediately called it like it is and made the change that was needed, hopefully. Yeah, I guess you just, you really have to believe in yourself in those moments. And I think we're all super vulnerable as artists and it's so easy to think that, well, this is, this one's going to, this is going to be the one or this is going to work out or it's going to be cool. And inevitably as an engineer or a producer or someone, you know, trying to manage, which is often we're managing a project, is you're the one that's left in a room running to the deadline and it's not working for whatever reason, even if you're the reason it's not working. And you got to be honest with yourself and from the beginning mm-hmm. and always checking in with yourself and be honest to be honest with other people. Well, let's break it down. Let's simplify it and take it into the studio for a sec. What are some things that typically happen where you run into that and you have to make a call on it when you're composing, for example, or playing the guitar? For instance, if you're playing the guitar and it's not your project or if you're playing for someone else, I think those stakes are a little different. Basically, you do what you do and hopefully it works. And then you're kind of, that's the nice thing about being a sideman is you're kind of in and out and you're kind of contributing your best ideas and maybe they work, maybe they don't. But I think it's more for when you're producing. I think my worst failures have come from situations where I was producing or mixing because often, like in the early days, like, and even now I'm mixing all the time, but I don't, I hate calling myself a mixer because I know guys like, you and all of our buddies in Nashville who are, those guys are, they're mixers, <laughs> you know, and I just had coffee with Craig Alvin just before this interview. He's, he's a mixer who I just admire so much. He's I know, a, I know what you mean about how you feel like that. He's a, he's amazing. And his interview with you was amazing. His everything group, his VCA yeah. everything group is a game changer. But what I was going to say is that for instance, on a mixing side, I remember getting a call from a young, super talented artist guy who was working with another producer. And 
they had mixed a couple tracks with a very famous uh, mixer and the stuff sounded really good. And then they wanted, they were in a bind and they needed to finish the record. And I had the first conversation with the guy and I felt like it was a little odd, but I was excited to be able to work on the project. But I knew something was funny about it, but I still did it. And in the end, like, you know, getting paid and, you know, the parameters of how to get it done were not, it just was a disaster. But I knew it was Mm -hmm. a disaster from the way the first phone call went, but I was so eager to try to be involved in the project. I didn't listen to myself. So that's an example as a mixer where you've got to really be clear because if you don't take on the project 110% and be prepared to do what you need to do to make it great, if you don't feel it was great in the end, it doesn't benefit you. Even if even if you did get paid, it doesn't help you because it's not something you can use as an example of your great work. And this is more important than short-term benefit always because you're trying to build a track record and you're trying to build a body of work that shows consistency and the ability to grow and develop yourself. So if you're not putting yourself for whatever reason, if you're not being put in those situations, you're not putting yourself in those situations, you really have to be self-aware at the end of the day. And you really have to be prepared and trust yourself to know that if you don't do it, or if you walk away, or you make a different decision, you can still help somebody find a solution to their problem by, I could mix one song, I could do this, I could do that, I can give you some numbers. I used to do this as a guitar player a lot. And even now, like sometimes I'll get called to do certain things. And I just know with my responsibilities... I can't do them. And it would always be better, especially in New York, was so good at this. If you knew you weren't the right person for the situation, you just always look so much better by saying, you know what? I listen to your music, you know, like agreeing to something you haven't heard, which a lot of us do is also a very dangerous thing to do. So you listen to something and go, hey, I'm not the right guy for this. I think it's really cool. But you know what? My friends who play guitar, I know the right person for this and get a pen because I'm going to give you some numbers. And then you were self-aware, you succeeded in the situation and you helped someone. And whatever that short-term benefit was far outweighs whatever um, would have come about, you know, taking it on and not being the right person and having it being a disaster and, and damaging your credibility. Well, and, you know, and if you believe in this kind of law of attraction concept, then as soon as you hang up with the phone with that person and you just freed up your time, you may get the call that was sent to you from somebody else that is exactly the project for you. You know, I, I agree with you 100%. And I realized, I mean, we all have our slow times and our ups and downs and it's human nature, but, you know, touch wood, you know. Actually, it's really funny because I feel like this is another part of, I mean, this is not so much about music, but that self-awareness and believing in yourself and kind of a lot of psychological things I don't fully understand. But I can honestly say that I've been at a plus minus relative level of whatever success I've been able to amass in my life since I was about 24. 425, whether it's playing weddings or doing what I'm doing now or just whatever that I feel like if you get too caught up in that part of it, you sabotage yourself where you just got to believe if you're on the path of mastery and on the path of developing yourself, something's going to happen and not something's going to happen, like something good's going to happen if you're doing the work. Well, you know, the famous quote from Ira Glass where he talks about, you know, first you develop your sense of taste And then it's only through a large body of work that you finally develop the skills to master creating what you had the taste for initially. And, and, you know, what you're describing is making sure that you keep focusing on the stuff that matches your level of taste so that the body of work you're creating has a chance to even grow and and appear. You know what? That's really funny you say that. That's so true because I think the most up close and personal I've ever gotten to seeing this was I was really lucky in such a random way to do some work with the synth pop band Erasure. And I made an acoustic record with them. And for those who don't know the band, it's two guys. It's a singer and a keyboard player, programmer, synthesizer. Yeah, these are are some of the EDM originators, right? Yeah, like for instance, and I'm really, really close friends with Vince Clark, who is considered, you know, the godfather of electronic music, along with people like Jean-Michel Jarre and a lot of these people. And when I worked with him... For instance, he's had three bands. He started Depeche Mode. He did the first record, wrote most of the songs in the first record and left the band and then started a band called Yaz, or we called it Yazoo with Alison Moyet. 
made one and a half records, disbanded that the same way, had incredible success. And then the third band, he started Erasure. And every time I sit and work with him, he is not precious about anything. He knows that tomorrow he's going to make something else. He knows that not everything's going to work. And he's open to outside opinions because that's interesting to him because he already knows what he thinks and he can already do that. I would say that to Kyle Lenning too. I would say, hey, Kyle. Most I would imagine a lot of people know who Kyle Lenning is, but he's a really, really great producer, engineer, super talented guy and like one of the most amazing people I've ever met. Because I was coming from that New York, produce, play, try to do everything. I'd be like, Kyle, why don't you, you don't really play on the records, but you're such a great organ player, keyboard player. And he'd go, Steve, he goes, I already know what I would play. So I want to see what someone else will play. And I, I can always play what I want to play later. I'm, I'm, I have the files. <laughs> That's great, man. Yeah, I just ran into Kyle last week. He's a great guy. In fact, I've worked with his son, Jason Lenning, yeah. here. And I had the distinct honor to have Kyle's dad show up once at the studio and I was able to take a photo of three generations of the Lennings. That's great. Fred was an amazing dude. Yeah. So very cool stuff, man. Thanks for sharing all those stories. Let's stick to EDM or to the electronic stuff for just a moment. Sure. And let's start to geek out. Let's let's bring it back onto some geeky text talk for a minute here. Can you share with us any cool electronic tricks or things that you remember, stuff that really knocked you out about the way to make a, an array your record that was very cool? Well, you know, the interesting thing, I was involved in two records. I produced an acoustic record for them, which had, you know, no keyboard instruments whatsoever. That was the rule. And what we did was we took songs of theirs that they love, but they never felt maybe, I don't know, they just always had a soft spot for those particular songs. And we created acoustic arrangements using everything from banjo, mandolin, pedal steel, waterphone, avant-garde percussion, all sorts of different stuff. But then I also worked on a record called Nightbird. It was a really interesting experiment because it would have been done in 2004, I believe. And it was right when things mm -hmm. like Native Instruments Complete was starting to actually be really happening and usable. For those who know, Vince Clark and I believe like Brian Eno, now probably who knows who has these amazing collections of analog synths, but Vince basically has everything. And when I say that, I mean literally everything. He actually, he had them everything in duplicate at one point, and he started to part things out and try to make just the mint condition version of each modular. Wow. It's like a museum. It's incredible. You were in that environment with it, everything at your fingertips? I have been, but the trick on this particular record was he wanted to challenge himself to try to make a record only using soft synthesizers because for his whole life, he had always used analog synthesizers and then when he went on tour, it wasn't possible to use those synthesizers because it was just so complicated. So he would start slowly, you know, by now he's using Logic or these sorts of things. But for a long time, he would go out and buy whatever the latest things were, like you'd go buy 10 D50s and reprogram all of his stuff to try to make it sound like he was using a Profit or trying to use like an ARP 2500 or, you know, a Juno 160 mm -hmm. or whatever. He'd go crazy trying to program this stuff, but he put a challenge on himself to see if it could be done with soft synthesizers. So that was super interesting. And that's what I'm saying about so many people go, he changed the script completely just to keep it interesting for him. In his studio, which he's moved everything from the UK, and first he moved it to Maine. He was living up in Maine for a while, and now he's back in Brooklyn, and he's moved the stuff to his studio. And one of the things he did early on, which is absolutely insane as he's built CV gate breakout boxes where he can sync everything and also patch boxes where, you know, his studio's in like a five, 600 square foot space and mm -hmm. all of his synths are on workbenches and kind of spread out where he's mounted monitors in front of each station of synths, even just like a single atom speaker just for mm -hmm. monitoring while he's building a sound or working on it. But he can patch from any module to any other module and not the way like we do with a Euro rack where we've got a bunch of little boutique modules in one rack. He's patching from the Roland modular synth, which he's got like 10 or 12 of them into a whatever and back and doing all this stuff. So he's able to create things that number one could never be recreated. So he's got to capture everything into the computer and he's got stuff that just nobody 
You can't get this much of this gear in one place at one time to even attempt to do this. It's insane. Wow. It's absolutely ins- amazing. And so have you, you've been in there and worked with him in this setting. And what is the, your experience when you hear a sound that's coming from the analog gear and patch like that? And how often do you have that same experience with a software synth? Do you find that you can get very close to the same sounds or do you, do you still find that sometimes it's just you got to have the old stuff to get that sound? I, I feel like it kind of falls more into a kinesthetic thing, the way people talk about consoles and tapes in using tape in these things where the sound is different, but it, it always ends up more about process because you can reach down and turn a knob or you can reach down and just plug something in where you're not mousing around. Or even if you've got a really robust mm-hmm. control surface, it's just not the same. It's getting better, but to try to make the in the computer experience be like the put your hand down and it's like having a guitar pedal and reaching down and turning up the modulation knob or something. It's just never going to be is immediate. It's just going to be a different experience. Well, all right, let's jump back into the studio and back into to the computer for a minute and talk about that stuff for a little bit, because those are clearly the tools that most of our listeners have access to as well. I want to ask you to share some tips for mixing in the box, stuff that you really enjoy. I mean, you're making some great records. I, I listened to the One Republic track that you had linked to, and I love the way that stuff sounded. And you know, you talk about recording an artist and may have giving it that feeling like it's just kind of on the edge, like it's got this live quality to it, but yet it's still programmed. So I'm, I'm leaping around a little bit here, but I just wanted to pay you that compliment for that track. Oh, thank you. Well, basically, I was as much a facilitator in anything. Those guys were on tour. Mm-hmm. And this is this is really interesting. I live in a building where there's a studio that's not my studio, but I spend a lot of time there with this really great guy and he's super crazy and he's got incredible gear in this place and it's incredibly affordable, (laughs) which is absolutely amazing. But a lot of bands work there, like Killing Jokes made a lot of records there. There's a lot of punk records that are made there, a lot of of different stuff. But when the Roma Public guys came, they were on tour and basically I'm kind of a board member of the studio in terms of... I'm a sounding board. And they came to me and said, hey, so this is going to happen. And we're going to set everything up and it's going to be great. And we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And I said, wait a second, guys, hold, hold the phone. I said, you guys have no, and how could they? They don't live in LA. They don't live in Nashville. They don't know how songwriters make records. These guys are going to come through this place like the Normandy invasion. <laughs> These guys, like a guy like Ryan Tedder is working on however many projects at the same time with so many different artists, including his own project, that these guys are not going to use your computer. These guys are not going to care how many Neve preamps you have. They're not going to care about, they're not going to care about any of this. They're going to care about how can I put my system into your speakers and how do I get up and running as quickly as possible? Yeah. Because every night they're jumping into different studios and doing stuff. So what I suggested is set up a bunch of instruments, set up some stations. You know, we spoke to production and got a sense of what they're trying to do. The most interesting part about it, I think I feel like my drawing on my background really helped in the situation because... I kind of knew what to expect. And sure enough, him and the band came, but it was really, you know, Ryan Tedder. And he also travels with a producer who I unfortunately forget his name, but is signed to his publishing company. And they basically set up two mirrored Universal Audio Apollo rigs and laptops in two of the studios and just started digging into working and getting as much stuff done after a gig they had played in Prague. And they came in back the next day and worked and finished some stuff up. So so they're capturing sounds. And exactly. And it was really interesting because this is kind of what I was just saying about with Vince, with the Erasure stuff, about being fearless and making decisions, knowing that time is of the essence and we got to go. So like, for instance, I had set up you know, in the studio, they've got an old, nice Ludwig, 70s Ludwig olive badge drum kit. And we set it up, pretty simple miking, just got it really, you know, really live and sounding good. And I'd set up a, actually a TLM 103, which is like a Neumann condenser microphone as a talkback. And they're like, we need to do some drums. And all of a sudden, almost like the way I guess... You know, I wouldn't equate myself to Bob Clearmountain in any way, but the way when they kind of found like that big explosive Tom sound by, I don't know what they used to do. They used to compress the talkback microphone on the SSL or yeah. something. But basically yeah. I opened up the talkback and they heard the guy hit the drums. They're like, what is that? And they're like, 
okay, so get rid of all those other mics. And they recorded all the drums through the talkback mic. But if we hadn't thought to set up the drums ahead of time, there was no time to get drum sounds. There was no time for anything. And they just said, that sounds cool. Let's do that. And they did it. And the whole process was done that way. And I guess I'm a little long-winded about it, but it's like you do all your preparation. You know, what do they say? I've been in the field working all day. What have you been doing? He's, well, I've been sharpening my ax all day. You know, right. so you can just come in and I'm butchering the quote, but this is the thinking is like, you need to come in and be prepared. I always come back to, I don't know if you remember this. There was a great tape op article years ago with Daniel Lanois, where he's talking about the plumbing, mm-hmm. the plumbing of the studio, meaning he's talking about, I don't care how early you have to get to the studio, even if it's days in advance to hook everything up and have a backup for the backup and be ready so when something happens, it can actually happen. And I, like in some ways, I I would almost rather be an assistant engineer for someone, you know, for my heroes for, that seems like it would be even more interesting for me because I love that part of it is the idea of, oh, well, did you record that or did you get that? Yeah. It's like, no, I was waiting for you to, waiting for you to do it, but no, no, but that was the thing. And there's, yeah, I was waiting for you to tell me that you were about to do something brilliant. <laughs> and once you cross that threshold, especially with truly, truly uniquely talented people, there's no way back. I mean, they're good enough that they can do it again and it'll be it'll be really good, but it may not be what that thing was. And that's, I guess, I guess we're getting off on a tangent, but what you were asking me about is tips for the studio, especially in the computer. It's all about preparation and it's all about being ready. I mean, maybe that's the problem with all of the computer stuff is there's so many tools, there's so many plugins, there's so many ways of doing stuff that everybody kind of jumps to this part so quickly where maybe it was better. Like I think the best thing for me ever, you know, I did a lot of work as a guitar player onto tape in these things, but as a musician, like I'm useless when it comes to a tape machine you know, unless I'm playing on something with a tape machine. For me, the first thing I ever really owned that was really useful was a Digi001. And I love that thing because yeah. I maxed it out where I could record 16 things into it onto a like a G, what would it be? A G3? One G4, of the- G3 was the first thing. Yeah. I had the green one and it was so cool to think of it that way. Like, and that was the thinking, you know, it actually worked too. That was the, the biggest thing about it is that it actually worked and you could record with that. You remember, we didn't really have latency issues when we had the Digi 01. I made that Erasure Union Street record. I tracked it on a Digi 001 and then I bought an HD system in between retracking it, editing it and getting ready to mix it. And then I got the HD system and Jason Lennon came up to Nashville. I came up to New York to mix it and we set it up. And basically in like a six hour window, we went from, you know, made the jump to hyperspace, you know? And it was like, yeah. it was so cool because I felt like it was so immediate. Also the way, like I knew a lot of guys had those Roland, what, what, what did they call it? The VS. Uh, the VS 1680s or something like that. It was the same kind of thing. It was so, it had so many built-in limitations that you had to make it good at the beginning. Because mm-hmm. it only it only went backwards. It was, you know, like, especially on those things, it's like the sound got worse as you went. So you really had to make it good in the beginning. Limitations are great. So like even now with like interns and assistants here, it's like I built a template when they're trying to learn how to, you know, get up to speed with different things. It's like the Digi EQ3 or like a Renaissance compressor, like an R verb and a D verb and a Digi Delay. It's like, learn how to use these things first because the lessons you learn with these things are going to only carry over to more complicated things. And it's the same with musicianship. It's like, you've got to learn the vernacular of what you're trying to do before you worry about esoteric things. Yeah, totally. Well, I mean, I agree. I think the plugins that come with every DAW now give you plenty of, of tools to work with and make a great record. And that, you know, when you expand into the plugin world, you know, it's just you know, it's more cool stuff, but you don't, you don't have to go there necessarily to get started and to make great sounds. Exactly. Exactly. 
Well, so let me get a couple of mixing tips from you before we take a break here and come back for the jam session. What do you like to do with your stereo bus, for example? Talk about what you like to mix through in the computer to get a sound. Is there anything that you often find yourself repeatedly doing? There is. It's funny. Right now, I'm at a point where I'm playing around with a lot of different things. But generally, I'll have some sort of EQs I like on the mix bus. Well, I think before the mix bus, and this is a big thing that I'm kind of spending a lot of time with now, is trying to get everything to do as little as possible, which helps obviously with gain staging and things. But basically, I'm going as simple as having like, you know, almost like groups before the mix bus that are feeding into the mix bus. So maybe sending all my drums to a pair, which would be like a, you know, a drum sub bus sending all my music to a bus and then all my vocals to a bus or vocals and background vocals. And that way I can control them independently of one another. And that way, especially with compressors, the vocals aren't affecting the track. So Mm -hmm. you're, you know, you're not changing the track by how loud somebody's singing. That's really interesting. But then I've gotten crazy at times for really blowing it out to really drums, percussion, bass, acoustic guitar, guitar, lead vocal, background vocals, keyboards, everything. And the other thing I'm fascinated with, and now the delay compensation's gotten so good in Pro Tools that I'm also finding, and this is important, like an audio post work, is being able to print stems that can as closely as possible recombine the actual mix because the archiving on projects is only getting more, it's just becoming essential. So Mm -hmm. I'm trying to find a way, a way to really make that work. It gets a little trickier on records, but in audio post, it's normal and has to be done where you're creating sound effects, dialogue, voiceover, music, all of this stuff has to be able to be printed as stems and recreate your mix because this is how, this is just normal and normal deliverables for these types of projects. Yeah. So, hey, rock stars, again, just to tell you what stems are, basically, if you have these different elements, like your drums and bass, you got your guitars, you got your keyboards, you got your vocals, and they all add up to make a mix and you print a two track of your mix. Stems means printing just the drums and bass, printing just the guitars, printing just the keyboards, just the vocals, with the idea, as Steve's suggesting, that you could recombine those, just mix them with no plugins, no nothing, and get the same sound that the final mix sounds like, if you want. And it, that allows film producers to re-edit things, you know, cut to just the drums, make different decisions, edit decisions later on. And that's absolutely on point. And also for the artists themselves, and this is maybe something that for young composer people to think about, the technology changes so much. What you're using today, you might not be using in six months or five years. And the truth is here, we have archives of music, of things we've composed that I've been composing music now for 16, 17 years that I'm still able to, from time to time or relatively frequently, license a piece of music I wrote years ago. But what happens if they say, you know, this track is really great and we'd love to use it for whatever. But you know what? I hate the accordion or I hate sleigh bells or I don't like fuzz guitar, which I I can't understand why someone wouldn't like that. But could you give it to me without it? And your first reaction is like, no problem. And then you open up your project from three and a half years ago and you realize you don't have these two plugins and you didn't consolidate your audio, let alone print stems and... Let's let's get even tougher than that. You don't you can't start up your Digio One anymore. You don't have that old version of Pro Tools. You don't even have the old computer that was needed with the old OS. That's exactly right. So what I suggest to people, you know, nobody said this is going to be easy, but especially for composer people, if you don't do this, it's a wasted opportunity. And it's a wasted opportunity about due diligence on your own part, and it's a wasted opportunity because you could lose out on a gig. When you finish anything, do it then. When you finish, don't wait. It only gets harder and you'll put it off. Even if you have to print the stems, even if it's drums, just basic stems, things printed in groups of instruments. Like a lot of times in commercials, it's much simpler than record mixing. So I'll just have going everything to a master fader with some an EQ compressor. I use a slate tape emulator from time to time. I use either ozone sometimes or I use a slate mastering compressor. Mm -hmm. And I bypass that. And what I do is I print each instrument with the effects. If I'm sending, you know, using effects sends, I'll print those files plus the mix. 
And then I create a new session, which I import these things back in, markers, tempo, any pertinent information. I also always keep any MIDI tracks because you can always go back in and edit the MIDI, which can be very helpful. But basically when you opened up one of my archived composition tracks, you have a mix, and then you have all of the stems, which are being routed via buses to an auxiliary track, which has the two bus processing on it. So basically if I make a group and solo my stems and solo the actual mix, they're very, very close. So you have no plugins, no effects, no nothing. And just as, an emer as a safety precaution, I always keep any MIDI, which is not so much down at the bottom. And this way, you know, younger guys who maybe have limited Pro Tool skills, but they're good musicians, that if someone calls up and says, I need four tracks for XYZ, I need four indie rock tracks, but I hate, you know, analog synthesizers, or I hate this, or I don't want to hear this, they can quickly open up things that might be appropriate and quickly, if you know how to Apple E separate audio, Apple M mute and bounce to disc, anyone who's relatively musical can create a new version and submit it for the particular opportunity because you'd spent that extra little bit of time at the end of the process when you composed it to archive the track. And as artists, our work is our only asset that we have. That's deep, man. That's well put too. I mean, it's it's true. What you did just to kind of re-explain a couple of things is you took a Pro Tool session that might have quite a lot of plugins and quite a lot of automation, heat, everything. Automation, everything, all of which would need to work again in order to recall that session later. And you narrowed it down to just a handful of plugins, just, you know, the EQ, the compressor, the tape emulator maybe three plugins that you will need to work later, but at least it's only those three that everything is routed through to recreate that. And in defense of the film producers, you know, people might go like, oh, come on, you know, what's wrong? If the accordion's good for the track, what's the big deal? Or if the fuzz guitars are good for the track, what people forget sometimes is that when you're producing film, these little things that don't seem to matter to us too much in music. They might just feel good. They really make a big difference in film because they set a scene and a tone and a setting and create like a story around the image. For example, an accordion, you can't, you can't get away from it. It pretty much creates a story of like, you know, uh, <laughs> a polka or we're in Paris, you know? Or the Czech Republic. <laughs> or the Czech Republic, exactly. <laughs> But you know, I would even go one further on that, Lidge. I would say that that's that fine line between being a particular type of artist. And this is an interesting thing. And the barometer runs the gamut, the full spectrum of where that line is for artistically. I won't change. This is what I'm going to do. This is the last and final word from me. And you know what? That's super cool. That's great. If that's how you want to do your thing, I support you 110%. But... If you are going to do things that way, you have to open heartedly accept what happens, you know, and as soon as you decide that you want to become a working artist musician and have to actually interact with other people, going back to what we said before, you have to decide for yourself, like, okay, if this is how it's going to be and this is how you want it to be, that's cool. But you can't be upset, you know, you can't have any bad feelings when someone decides they don't want to collaborate with you or collaborate with that or use that particular piece of music. And I always come back to is keeping your eye on the bigger picture of it's about living a creative life, being in the process. And these things, if like muting the accordion or muting the fuzz guitar in your track is the thing that kills your track... I don't know. Sometimes I feel like maybe the track deserves to be killed in the sense that like write another track. Getting caught up in this stuff is not conducive to being creative. That's good, man. I like that. That's a good that's a good tip and a good quote to 
go into the jam session from. So let's take uh, Rockstars. We're going to take a break here for a second. We'll come back right back for the jam session. Again, our guest is uh, Steve Walsh, and we're psyched to have you here on Recording Studio Rockstars with us. We will have links to everything that Steve's talking about, the records he's created, and some of the stuff we're talking about here on the show in the show notes, which you can find at recordingstudiorockstars.com or rsrockstars.com. Use the magnifying glass search window and just search Steve Walsh and, and you'll find the blog post. And then if you're on your iPhone, you can just click through with the podcast app and you should find the show notes right there on the episode. You can just touch it with your finger, click right through, and it'll take you to the stuff we're talking about in the show notes. So stay tuned. We'll be right back for the jam session. Hey, everybody, it's Lid Shaw, and I want to thank you so much for listening to this episode of Recording Studio Rockstars. I really appreciate you, and I really appreciate your time. And as a way of saying thank you, I've created a special mix tutorial just for you, Rockstars, totally free, called the Mix Master Bundle. With it, you get over two hours of detailed videos watching over my shoulder as I mix a song in my studio. Plus, I give you the free ebook that explains how I recorded the tracks and you get downloadable multi-tracks so that you can practice your mixes, including the Pro Tools session file, using nothing but stock plugins in Pro Tools, all of which you would find in any other DAW, whether you're on Logic or Studio One or Reaper. Maybe you're struggling with trying to improve your mix technique, or maybe you just simply don't have access to multi-track files or can't record a full drum set in your studio. I wanted to give you a chance to create your own mixes from full drum drum kit, bass, and guitar is recorded in my studio. The song is called American Winter, and it's off my instrumental record, Skadoosh, and it's all available for you totally free right now. All you need to do to get it is text Mix Master Bundle to 33444, and I'll send it directly to your email. Again, that's Mix Master Bundle with no space to 33444, or you can go directly to mixmasterbundle.com, enter your email, and I'll send all the files directly to you. Thanks so much, rock stars. We'll see you guys in the jam session. Cheers. Hey, rock stars, it's Slid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rock Stars. We're about to jump into the jam session with our guest today, Steve Walsh. And Steve is joining us through the wonders of Skype from Prague in the Czech Republic. Steve, my friend, are you ready to jam? I'm ready to jam, baby. All right, dude. So when you got started out in recording, what was one of the big things that was holding you back? What was a big obstacle for you? Things like mixing boards and like doing sessions on ADATs and stuff like that, or even in a regular studio with, God forbid, a tape machine really freaked me out. <laughs> I have to say, I was much happier on the other side of the glass. So even today, like sometimes people ask me to engineer something, like a lot of times I would engineer at places like, well, I guess it's gone now. Quad is now. Yeah. Marty Fredrickson bought it. I think it, I think it may have changed. Yeah. I remember engineering a lot of records in the B room on that old knee or on an SSL 4000 or something or that. Even now I get butterflies. I get so nervous with these things because I just, <laughs> I like how easy it is to use Pro Tools. So I have to be honest, I'm maybe not truly an engineer. So that was the thing that really intimidated me whenever, even if it was just using a Mackie mixer, I get, <laughs> I would get overwhelmed. <laughs> Okay, cool, man. Well, so um, how about some of the best advice you remember receiving? The best advice I always remember is I was really lucky to study with a teacher. This was not for recording or anything, but to study with an amazing improvisation teacher in New England to a lot of really, really, really famous jazz musicians have all studied with him. His name was Charlie Banacos. And Charlie used to say, it can either take 10 minutes or 10 years and I think what he always meant with that is it's up to you. It's like, if you want to do something, do it, learn about it, get involved and don't wait. Like you're going to have to do the work anyway. It's like, just do it. I don't know how else to say it. I think that was the best advice for me is like, you know, you can be 12 years old and you can be really great. You can be 80 years old and be really great, but you have to do something. Yeah. You don't want to be sitting around sharpening your ax all the time. Or not even buying an axe in the first place. Like, pay attention. First one to the session, last to leave. Watch everybody. You know, and I have a big document that I give to interns that I've been compiling over the years of things you can do. But the, the first thing is, 
I remember a friend of mine who used to do all the teching for Phil Ramone. He was the chief tech at Right Track in New York. And he used to always say to me, he goes, you know, Steve, I could always judge an intern by the way they would sweep the floor in Studio A, you know, the big, the big, huge room. And I knew after that if it was going to work or if it wasn't going to work. Right. You could just tell from the attention to detail. Yeah, maybe that's the best advice. It's not very practical or tangible, but... That's good stuff. I think without that, all of the little words of wisdom or little bits of advice don't hold a lot of water. Yeah, I think just do it. I think even Nike liked that one. (laughs) I was lucky. I was lucky when I suggested that one to them. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) All right, so how about sharing with us a recording tip, hack, or secret sauce, something that our listeners, our rock stars, can use right now today on their next session? Preparation is everything. Being prepared. Know something about who you're going to be working with. Ask your friends. Use Google. Do whatever you have to do. Like Know what you're getting yourself into. Know what you're going to need. Have some anticipation of what you're going to try to do when you're going to record. The other thing is, it's all little things. It's like making the person you're working with, it's not about you at that moment. It's about them. You know, creating an environment where they feel inspired. Like I always think to make your studio, you need to make it ergonomically work for you, but you also need to make it work for the people who are coming to work there. And I guess that was maybe the great thing about, you know, the songwriting process in Nashville and working with different writers and different publishers is like, because those things, you know, like a singer who really doesn't care anything about a recording studio doesn't care about your microphone or what kind of silver plated, you know, cables you have or that you've got special power cables or they don't care about any of this stuff. They care that they would like to have a cup of tea or they need a pencil or the pencil they have is not sharpened and they can't write their lyrics or sketch out their idea or they have nowhere to write it or the bathroom's a disaster or or this that when they sing a note, it's going to be one of the best notes they've sung. Absolutely. So making somebody you're going to work with feel secure, inspired, and being ready to create the space for them to do that is going to help you so much more than knowing how to use the newest compressor because you could know how to use the newest compressor. And without having done all of those other things, the person you're working with may not be able to understand what's actually happening because they don't feel good. Yeah. That's great advice, man. So I was going to repeat that same idea, which is, you know, a lot of times when we don't know stuff yet, or we think we need to learn more stuff, we're thinking, geez, I need to learn about gear. I need to learn how to work in the computer more or whatever. And you make the point that it's that those are, if you're working with another artist, you know, it's the, it's that artist and what their needs are. And any of us are capable at any time of just simply going and learning more about a person using Google, calling them, talking to them, and just better understanding what it is that they do. And that's going to create far more valuable results than if you just knew how to do something tweaky in the computer to mix. And it creates so much more empathy on their part for you If you are at a place, if you get into a moment where you're struggling with something or you're trying to figure something out, they will intuitively feel that you're empathetic towards them and care about what you're doing and care about the situation, that they're going to have so much more patience with you if you're struggling with something as opposed to the opposite. Good point. It's, It's sort of this do unto others as you would have them do under you. If you show a great deal of patience with the artist and understanding, they're going to do the same thing in return while you're helping them make their record. Well, so Steve, how about sharing with us a favorite hardware tool, something that you like to have on sessions? I'm guessing a guitar is probably one of them, but is there anything unexpected that you've always got around that that seems to be good for your sessions? Of course, guitars, but you know, moving to another country, wow, that really changes a lot of stuff because moving stuff across an ocean gets much more complicated. But yeah, I love old guitars. Paired it down to two, you know, three or four guitars. The one game changer for me is I have a great old 68 Telecaster, which was a Paisley Telecaster that had that crazy pink flowered paper on it, and it's kind of been stripped off. I love that. The biggest, actually, the biggest game changer in the last six months... And I think everybody should do this because 
I've got some back problems and some tendonitis and things I'm struggling with from years of sitting in those folding chairs playing guitar mm-hmm. with a mouse in one hand and all of these things. So recently, and I'm, you must be able to get it in the States because I got it here too, is all of our control rooms, we have standing desks. Very cool, man. I, I'm standing right now. So basically, I got those isoacoustic stands that they're making now, which I didn't know they were making them because I got a pair through Dyne Audio with some monitors. I was in the States in January in Alabama, of all places. I went into a guitar center and I saw these. I'm like, hey, so I ordered them. So I've got my near field monitors angled and mounted on my desk. And basically these Ikea standing desks are huge. I'm able to do full mixing. You know, we've got good tall ceilings in the control room and the bigs in the front of the room, which are not that big. They're like the mid mid-sized dines. I don't know what model they are. It's amazing. And it's like, you wouldn't think there's another, maybe another benefit of just working in the computer is just being able to stand and be able to be moving really. It's been amazing for me. Yeah. I think that's a great tip. And that's actually just the kind of thing that I was hoping you would share, um, you know, as opposed to just telling us about the 1176 again. Um, I, it's very cool to be reminded that these ergonomic things are so critical and something as simple as a standing desk, as simple as being comfortable. You know, for me, standing up and moving around during a session wakes up my body and wakes up my brain. And when my brain's awake, I just do better, make better decisions and I do better work all the time, you know? Absolutely. And I wasn't sure in the beginning, I'm like, is this going to work? And my partner, William Bedish, who is a amazing keyboard player, composer guy, he was like, I need to stand when I work. And he got it. And I'm like, oh man, I, you know, I'm thinking old school, you know, I don't know, yeah. old guy, old guy studio thinking, I'm like, really, you're going to have a standing desk. And then as soon as he got it, I was like, I got to get one of those. That's <laughs> awesome. So yeah, that's the best investment I've made in the last year. Very cool. Well, maybe you can take a couple of photos of the studio and, and send them. We'll put them in the blog post too. Sure. Well, so now let, let me jump forward. Next question. How about a favorite software tool? Something that you might want to suggest to everybody that's really helpful for recording? Personally, for me, I'm using the same stuff most of all of us are using. Like, of course, I'm using Pro Tools, which it really doesn't matter what workstation you use. But, you know, I'm using Waves, I'm using Sound Toys, Slate, Universal Audio, Native Instruments. But that's not really the point. The point for me is like going back to like the Digi001 or just limitations as learning. Like EQ3 is amazing. And I remember like I would always be asking, you know, like Jason Lenning, we've known him for so long and like, hey, Jason, we shared a studio for a long time ago on 16th Ave South. I think it was next to Bobby's Idle Hour. I'd be like, well, what do you do this? Or how'd you make it sound like this? And he'd open up like EQ3 and a Renaissance compressor or the Bomb Factory 1176. And I'd be like, <laughs> I go, wait a second. <laughs> you didn't use something expensive? Yeah, exactly. And he has some great gear, of course, but it's his ears and it's his thinking and all of these things. So, I mean, that's really to me, it's like the best software tools are less is more knowing what you're using for recording software and just getting the most out of it. I would even go so far as to say the best software tool is the one that's living between your ears. That's absolutely true. Well, cool, man. Well, now how about a resource for the business side of doing this? You know, for those of us who aren't doing this for a hobby, you know, whether it's a person, a technique or software, what what advice do you have for us? Well, that's, I have to say, that's where my, most of my days are spent these days. So I'm, I'm all about this. I hate email. I I was able to keep my head above water for so long with email. And now, because we're managing so many like short form audio posts, composing projects that, and you're dealing with so many people and Mm -hmm. we're dealing with many different countries. It just became unmanageable. It became unmanageable. So basically things that I use all the time, Basecamp, which is a project management software tool. I love it. Has become a game changer. And it's so integrated now. And there's also programs like Asana and there's a few others. They all do basically the same thing. You know, it's logic versus Pro Tools. It's just different, but does the same exact thing. So basically Basecamp is incredible because you can deal with your clients. You can deal with teams. You can deal with everything. You can put all your files in it. You can link to Google documents. It's amazing. A little bit of a learning curve, like everything that's worth using, but it's been very good for us. I get very inspired by, and these may be people that are a little outside of audio land, but I think there's so many great tips from people like Tim Ferriss, who wrote the four hour work week, and it's a kind of a banged up name, mm-hmm. but 
but like the idea of how to free yourself of things that are just sucking your time and not working. It's a guy named Noah Kagan who has a company called OK Dork. He is amazing at marketing and streamlining and all of these things. He's incredible. Tim Ferriss in particular is amazing. And if you like podcasts like this, it's not a music podcast, but his interviews are, he just interviews incredibly fascinating people. Yeah, he's great. I would say that the four hour work week sort of launched my interest in the internet and internet business and all that stuff. Oh, that's cool. That's super cool. Do you listen to Pat Flynn? Smart Passive Income as well, his podcast? You know what? I've listened to him on some of these other podcasts, but I haven't listened to him in particular, but I'll, I definitely would check it out because I love these things. He's somebody He's somebody that I admire a lot, and I, I recommend him to you, rock stars, if you're looking for stuff that's outside of the music, but all about you know what you can do with your, your business and your work online. Pat Flynn's a great guy to follow. You know, to me, these are the things that are the most interesting to me at this point because- they're really wide angle. Well, they get these people get super specific, but getting into this wide angle mode, and then you can go and get specific information for whatever you yourself are juiced up about learning about. He's great. Another guy that I think is amazing. He's maybe a little little too much for some people, but there's a guy named Gary Vaynerchuk right. who is an incredible marketer. And in my world, he's super interesting. And he's super interesting for musicians, in my opinion, because, you know, he says things like the guy that bought 20,000 horses the day before the Model T came out, you know, well, he got screwed. I guess what I'm trying to say is our business has fundamentally changed for people like me. I'm 45. Like it's changed so much. But what are you going to do about it? It wasn't perfect before. It's maybe not perfect now, but it's just the way it is. And the sooner you get your brain around the idea that it's 2016 and this is how you do something, you know, if the situation doesn't have any animosity, the system's not trying to hurt you, the current state of the music business, it's just the way it is. And the sooner you adapt to the way it is, the sooner you can get past all of this of not being happy about the situation. Right. I'm not making right. it, I'm not making any sense. I'm going No, no, off, no. It makes perfect sense. I mean, you know, get with the program. Just do it already, right? Well, because the alternative is not going to work either. You know, it's like you're just going to be bitching about whatever. Whatever it is, it's not working about it, but it never worked that great before. So it's like now there's more opportunity. Like exactly what you're doing with your podcast is fascinating and it's more holistic. You're creating empathy, you're creating a network, you're sharing all of these experiences. That's, that's something real and has some real intrinsic value. Well, thank you, man. I appreciate that. And, and I really enjoy sort of participating in and helping to foster a community that connects people. And it's, it's so encouraging. I mean, I get emails from people all over the world writing in saying they're listening to the show and enjoying it. In fact, I just met somebody just recently who was a listener of the podcast and give a shout out. I won't drop names just in case he prefers to remain anonymous, but he'll know I'm talking about him. He's a, he's a police officer. And he says he, you know, he makes music on the weekends. He loves making records. And I learned that he actually listens to the podcast when he's driving around in the cruiser, you know, and I thought that was the coolest thing ever. That's super cool. Yeah, that's great. So, I mean, that kind of stuff just is so meaningful to me and it's, it really brings it down to earth and makes it kind of fun. But, you know, another thought I had too was the music business is changing. And when I started this, I might've thought that, the opportunity for me was just only to make records for musicians and hope that those records sell and that that was the thing that would sort of make the musical world turn. And what I'm seeing is that there's also an opportunity to help educate and help, you know, foster the the creativity of everybody making records and that that is every bit as valid and every bit as meaningful and, and as important as just simply making records themselves. Because, you know, think about it, rock stars, you're listening to the show and you're out there making your own records. I feel like I'm able to help make more music by just helping other people make their own records the way they want to make all over the place than if I was just sitting here making my own record and going, gosh, I sure hope everybody wants to buy my record tomorrow. Absolutely. That's really something because if you're lifting a scene up to another level, like if you're an outlier in one small scene, that doesn't really help anybody. But if you're lifting up a scene, which now you can do virtually from all over the place, that's so much hipper, in my opinion. Well, thanks, man. You just called me hip, dude. Thanks. <laughs> 
Well, so, hey, uh, Steve, we only got a couple more questions, but here comes the hypothetical one, which is, Imagine yourself dropped off in a strange new land. Wait a minute, that happened to you. It's, it's a place called Prague. It's, it's not so hypothetical. <laughs> so you know the question already, but here it comes anyway. You know, if you needed a simple recording setup to get going, what would you do? Let's say, you know, let's not, let's not worry about the budget, but just let's just say it's, you know, something very affordable that it, that's within most people's reach or hopefully most people's reach. And how would you find people to record and make music with? And then what would be some first decisions for how you might make ends meet to survive and keep doing it? As you said, I am the test case. <laughs> I moved to maybe not the most remote place, but definitely a, a more remote place than others. I thought about this question from two angles. The first thing you have to do is you have to become part of the scene. And Nashville is very much this way. Actually, Prague and Nashville, it's going to be the same answer, I would have to say, is you have to become part of a scene and you have to add some value to the existing scene. I thought you were going to say you have to start busking. <laughs> well, this too, but don't they crack down on you on that? And at least in Nashville, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just, I'm just kidding around. <laughs> I know, I know. So let's look at it from two ways. If you can afford a simple setup, cool. But the other way to do it is to get yourself in the door, in any door. And the key here is you need to make yourself irreplaceable at whatever it is. So for instance, I would say, Look at studios that are in the city you're moved into. You could go and just start working for them for free. Just start showing up, trying to help. If you have some experience from some other place, you're probably going to be valuable. If you've got some skills, maybe they're not musical skills, they could be valuable. If you have a simple setup with a laptop and an interface and a couple microphones, that's cool too. You could also bring that system to that studio and start, now there's another setup in the studio and you can start helping them that way. It's just get involved, get involved in the scene. So like, for instance, what I did in Prague, there's an incredible scene of a lot of great improvised music, a lot of great jazz musicians. And there's a lot of blues here. I've played a lot of blues. I've played a lot of improvised music. So the first thing I did was not like, I moved here and I'm here now, as I just started going out, hanging out at people's gigs, supporting the local music, which I was excited about and into. It wasn't for some ulterior motive. And then slowly you get to know people. It doesn't take that long. And then you start finding ways you can help them. And that's the fastest way. And I'm talking, this is within six months to a year. If you're really, really focused on it and cranking on it, this is going to happen. You're going to, you're going to start to find a place for yourself. And then as far as making money, it's always better if that is on another lane, another stream, another channel, because this first thing is kind of a startup investment that may not initially yield rent money, but that's okay. And for me, I've always said, you know, you have your successes, you think you're, you know, you've done some things, you're psyched about it, whatever. And it's so easy sometimes to cop an attitude and be like, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Don't they know who I think I am? I'm going to, I think it's totally insane to do this because like for myself as a musician, I've always been excited about the idea that I could basically go anywhere in the world and entertain people in pretty much any bar or any situation where people are hanging out and make plus or minus a hundred bucks, a couple of beers, and maybe something to eat. If you just learned 50 to a hundred of the right songs, and it's better than fixing the street for me, maybe for other people, fixing the street is better, but we're lucky as musicians. That comes back to work ethic and trying to master something, being engaged it's like learning 50 of the right songs that the majority of the people on the planet have agreed are good songs, even if it's not exactly what you think is the perfect music, is not going to hurt you. And it will actually maybe save your life in the right, uh, right international traveling situation. Yeah. Well, it's great <laughs> advice, too, because, I mean, as you obviously would might guess, I would say a lot of our listeners are musicians themselves that are also recording and it's great to be encouraged and reminded that learning cover songs and like you said, just a core of a hundred popular songs will open a lot of doors to you. Not to mention the fact that it will help you better understand what goes into a very popular song, you know, and, and the production elements as well. Well, absolutely. I mean, if you're studying for an MFA, like a master's in fine arts, or if you're studying jazz, 
you're studying a pedagogy, you're studying a history, and you need to know you spend all of that time transcribing or recreating the key pieces of work that helped evolve the particular art style. You have to do these things. And I look at it on the other example, because sometimes you get more rock guys. I've seen this and I'm not, I don't mean to generalize, but learning how music works or the secrets of music is going to make me less creative or, or this is too intellectual or this is this and that. You only need to learn what you need to learn to do what you want to do. And it's super simple. And maybe that sounds kind of convoluted, but you have to learn it. Like if you want to play, you know, 20th century impressionistic music, you need to learn different things than if you want to play punk rock music. But if you want to play punk rock music, it's in your own best interest to learn as much as possible about punk rock music. It's not going to hurt you. <laughs> right, so. right, totally. <laughs> well, so that almost answers the, the final doozy of a question, which I'll throw at you anyway. And it's just simply this. What's the single most important thing that our listeners can do to be a rock star of the recording studio themselves? Just got to do it. Just don't stop. You got to keep, just keep that beginner's mind. Dedicate yourself to mastery. Watch, learn, ask questions. Don't be a jerk. And keep doing it and doing it. And something is eventually bound to happen that should be good for you if you don't stop and just keep doing it. That's great, man. Great. That's great advice and great to go out on that too. Rock stars, just keep doing it. Just record like your life depended on it. <laughs> so Steve, tell us how can our listeners find you? How can they follow you, learn more about you, learn about your productions, et cetera? How do they reach out to you? I guess the best way is on Facebook through my artist page, I guess, which is facebook.com slash Steve Walsh Music or on Twitter at Steve Walsh Music. I think Facebook is the best because it'll lead you to all the other things. I'm trying to start trying to share more of myself. And it's really nice for me to try to do that through different social mechanisms just because, you know, I live in I live far away from all you guys and my mutual friends, our mutual friends listen to this. And I don't see people as much as I did when I'm back home. And I miss it, frankly. And it's it's great. It's We haven't spoken in so long. And it's amazing yeah. to see what you're doing with the podcast. And it's super inspiring. And um, Well, thanks, and, man. Uh, I appreciate yeah, that. Really appreciate the opportunity. And my pleasure, man. Our pleasure. And it's super inspiring to have you on the show. And your work is inspiring in itself, you know. So thanks. Thank you for taking the time out and meeting with us. You know, it's always sort of mind blowing to me that we're, you know, speaking across oceans right now. So absolutely. Very cool stuff. Well, hey, Steve, thank you so much for being on Recording Studio Rockstars. And we look forward to seeing more of you around the internet then, I guess. I hope so. Thanks, Lidge. I really appreciate it. If not in person in the studio. How do you say goodbye in, in Czech? Ciao. Ahoy. Ciao. Ahoy, man. I love it. All right, dude. Thanks so much. You got it. Take care. Be well. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444, and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music.